God designed us to be learners. However, much of our learning and discipleship today regarding the church, current affairs, and theology has been reduced to pithy sayings and viral tweets. Just Say It seeks to help Christians go deeper on church, theology, scripture, and current issues in our world. I'm Chase Davis. And I'm Matt Patrick. And join us and other guests for a monthly conversation on the topics that are impacting Christians in the church here in Colorado. You can expect candid conversations on the topics ranging from church attendance during ski season to Spurgeon's view of the atonement. Well, thanks for joining us today for another episode of Just Say It. Today, we've got me and Matt on the episode uh, here to share with you today. We want to talk about what's going on in Israel. Matt, why are we talking about Israel today? I didn't even know we were talking about that until we got here. No, I'm joking. Yeah, right. um, no, I mean, <laughs> no, you know, it, it's an interesting question. Uh, well, one, I, I think it's a fair assumption that people make about our church is we tend to not be the kind of church that shies away from hot topics that are going on. Um, we, we like to think that we are also a church that uh, plans on doing that well and once enough information is gathered. And so, um, you know, some people in our church have asked, why haven't we talked about it from the stage and so on and so forth. And everything was so fresh. We really wanted to be able to kind of just gather enough information and uh, be diligent in what we had and be able to give a, uh, a, a right Christian response for our church in particular as to what we see going on in the world. You know, th- there are times, you know, it was brought up today in our church chat, uh, you know, hey, you guys were quick to do something on Roe v. Wade versus this like what, what's the difference there well the difference is is what we believe that murdering babies is and is uh is clear cut in in the abortion sense now what's happened in israel there's a lot of things that are clear cut that are evil and wicked no doubt about that but the geopolitical realities of what's going on there makes it more complex and so we wanted some time to kind of put our heads together do some research and then come back to you all um, as your pastors and just maybe walk through some of this yeah, and I, this is like exactly why we created the podcast. You know, it's something I wish we had back in 2020 or even yeah. since we began. It's just an easy way rather than saying, let's call a church-wide meeting to talk about Israel. We can uh, share some reflections, some thoughts. But even events like, you know, whether it's January 6th, the Afghanistan pullout, the um, the death of George Floyd, all these things are perfect uh, opportunities of why we made this platform. So uh, as we saw... Israel getting worse and worse and more ramifications, uh, we just felt it was most necessary to talk about it here because we were getting questions from various people. People are talking about it, and so we need to provide a biblical perspective from our for our particular church, from our particular convictions. And so I think it's a really important thing. Um, obviously, this is a lively topic, uh, not just online, but for a lot of people. You know, even in my own home, we're talking like, we grew up in a, in a certain theological tradition. And so, you know, my wife was like, is this a sign of the end times? And like, that makes sense if you were raised in our theological tradition. Um, and I was like, no, but we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that kind of stuff on the podcast. And ultimately, like our statement of faith and, and our church covenant say relatively little about what we should think of the modern state of Israel. Um, I know some uh, from a different theological background have explicit statements in their statement of faith. Their church has, mm-hmm. what do we believe about Israel? No, um, that's just not what our church believes. So we are recording this. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to add one other thing. Um, I I would, I think it's important to point out too, that it's not that we've never talked about Israel before. Uh, We're a church that generally preaches through books of the Bible. When we have to deal with these things, that's when we teach about them. Right. And so several years ago, I preached a sermon on the Olivet Discourse that deals with that passages in Matthew that deal with that. And how are we to view uh, the church in Israel, and I tried to give a broad enough uh, teaching on that. So it's not the first time, but it, it has been a long time. And so that's a fair thing, especially if you're newer in our church and you haven't heard anything. So it's just we haven't come across it in the book of John like we're studying right now. And so it might seem like, why aren't they going to talk about it? It's like, well, the texts we have planned out haven't been on that yet. Yeah, exactly. So uh, what we want to do is situate this historically. Let's say someone five, ten years, um, two hundred years from now is writing the Chronicles of Matt Patrick, and they stumble across <laughs> this episode as they're <laughs> writing the book of his life, the crazy journey that it's been. So we are recording this on October eighteenth, twenty twenty three. Um, here's kind of what we know. 
um, or we think we know, uh, mm. pretty certain we know, October 7th, 2023, Hamas, which is a terrorist organization founded in the Gaza Strip, which is Palestinian, uh, launched a coordinated attack primarily uh, at a music festival, but there were other incursions as well. Um, it included thousands of rockets launched, which isn't necessarily new. Um, this mm -hmm. was a, definitely a surprise attack, and you know, 2,500 militants uh, around there coming into Israeli territory. That's a lot of people armed, ready to kill. They killed unarmed men, women, and children, um, babies included. Uh, they're currently holding hostages. Some reports up to 200 hostages were taken back. And 13 of those, from what we understand, are Americans. So we have around, the result of that was about 1,400 people were killed um, in the course of that action, that terroristic action against the uh, country of Israel and the people therein. And so over time, we are seeing more information come out, and we've seen Israel counterstrike. So now, at this point in time, Israel is has been bombarding uh, what they believe to be Hamas locations within the Gaza Strip, and they're getting ready for a ground assault. Whether that started already or not, we don't know. We know there was some kind of flood that prevented that. But those are kind of the situations on the ground. But it's escalated into geopolitical stuff where we have, you know, riots at U.S. embassies. Um, very, very Benghazi-esque, uh, if you remember that episode. Um, and you can go watch that movie. I don't know if I can endorse it as a pastor, but just as a human, I like the movie a lot. I'll go ahead and say um, I endorse it, since we're writing okay, the Chronicles crazy. of Matt Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great for your biographers. <laughs> yeah. um, so we're seeing riots. We're seeing institutions, even University of Colorado, issue statements on this matter. Uh, we're seeing um, students and people in different countries around the world, England, France, United States, uh, do stuff. We're seeing the U.S. send a carrier group into the Mediterranean Sea to be on standby. Um, and so these are kind of the events surrounding the the kind of pressure uh, that Christians feel to understand what's going on. Um, so what are what are some things that as we kind of lay out what we want to talk about today? What are some things we want to talk about, Matt? Yeah, and, and before that too, just to kind of piggyback off of what you were saying there, Chase, which is good um, and exactly right. I, I think when we when we were saying what we know. Um, I, I don't think it matters what side of a political aisle you come from. Uh, information in our day and age is fast and it's furious and it's not always accurate and a lot of it has motives behind it. I think we can all agree on that. And so it's really hard to kind of just boil stuff down to like this is factual. A good example of that would be the uh, reports that Israel struck a Baptist hospital with a rocket. and. From what I understand now, and it might even change again, but it seems like now that's not the case. And that was being leveraged to say like how Israel's wrong in this, you know, that they're bombing innocent civilians. So it's, it's very hard. And so I would ask listeners for grace for us as we try to go, we're not a news outlet, we're pastors, you know, and, and we're trying to do the best we can. And so with that, I think it's important to kind of define what we want to talk about um, and, and that we're not going to offer a geopolitical solutions for the world. That's not our job. Um, believe it or not, as we've been labeled other things in our lives as pastors, um, we do believe that there is a difference between the magistrate or the political leader and the pastor's role. And so, uh, and so I think that's important for us to admit that and go, that's not our job necessarily, but we can still bring the Bible to bear on to that. And so it's a complex situation. And, uh, and, and what we can do for sure is condemn, uh, uh, w without any moral confusion at all, uh, Hamas's attack on Israel and recognize uh, Israel has a right and a duty to defend itself. I think we can, um, we can lay that out with some certainty. W wouldn't you agree, Chase? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it seems uh, hard to do nowadays. I'm reticent to do that kind of stuff, but I, I absolutely agree because, you know, when you're going into another country and you're slaughtering babies and women and that kind of stuff, um, it, it's hard to, to justify those actions, even though some of the protesters in our country uh, that are sympathetic to the Palestinian plight um, 
they would say it's justified. Um, you know, as Christians, I don't think that's a thing we can do. So, yeah, it's it, it's a shocking thing. And hopefully by saying all this, we're not giving away too much too early. I think mm. there's a lot of Christians from a lot of different streams that can arrive at that conclusion. But how we arrive at that conclusion matters because yeah. it's how we process the events going on in our world. Yeah, for sure. And and, and for, for us, you know, a big part of this, what we, what we want to say is that uh, we need to understand the role of Israel in the Bible. You can't, you can't skirt that. There is a very distinct role um, in the New Testament and the Old Testament. Um, obviously, um, throughout the pages, you, you can see it and it's clear. Um, and that plays out in our day and age um, from an eschatological standpoint. And, you know, there's, there's three primary views out there of where you could land on that. Either you're dispensational, you're amill, or you're post mill, you know, those are kind of the general, there's other ones in there, but those are going to kind of play out in this conversation as well. Yeah. So with all this kind of chaos with the, you know, you've got propaganda efforts being waged by multiple nations, by multiple entities, Hamas, Israel, the U S you've got people in the U S government who have their own proclivities. Um, and so I think it's just it's helpful for people to have a clear biblical explanation in order to do that What we want to do first is provide some historical context um, Because a lot of people just hear Israel nation-state today and they equate it to Israel Bible And so we have to understand that the modern state of Israel was founded in 1948 as we understand it today. It was uh, founded as a modern liberal democracy which ethnic Jews could settle um, one could call it like the last colonial project after a lot of the colonial projects were, were uh, abandoned and then turned over to the local populations in the 20th century. This was one that uh, was started in 1948. And so since the beginning of its inception, this has been a land dispute uh, between those who existed before the modern nation state of Israel existed and those who resided there for hundreds of years. The, the local, what, what they call Palestinians, have resided in that area for years. And so, um, Matt, why don't you give some more background on kind of the historical context? Yeah, I, I think, you know, because it's not a, it's not, a, I mean, 1948, that's a long time for us. None of us were alive. Um, you and me, I mean, maybe there's somebody listening who was, but, um, you, you're, you know, but, uh, but for us, you know, I think we have to understand what's going on in, in recent history to understand it. And to understand the region, uh, you have to understand there's a breakdown of um, what I would refer to as kind of four main factions that are seeking to control what's going on in the Middle East. Um, and uh, the, what one would be the Turks, which are Sunni um, Muslim. You have the Sunnis, which are which is a large group that's Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Egypt. Um, people argue for a few others, but those are the big players in there. Um, and you can guess why they have lots of money. And um, in our current geopolitical world, if you have oil, if you have money, um, those sorts of things, you're a player. And so th those are pretty big players in there. The third one, a big one, even though it's not large in the scope of land, would be Israel. So Jewish. And then four, you have the Shia Persian, which would be Iran. OK. And so you kind of have these four factions um, navigating these tensions around each other. And you kind of have Israel right in the middle of it, which stands very different than the rest of them, you know, and, and um, in this small land, in this interesting uh, historical context that you have going all the way back to birthrights and all these things. And so there, it, it's massively complex, but kind of in our modern context, uh, in, in general, and not, not, not trying to get too far out of our area, like if you go back to um, President Trump's administration, uh, what, what you saw was an attempt to get um, the Sunnis, uh, which would be Saudi Arabia, UAE, Egypt, and Israel to kind of come together, to coalesce, recognize Israel as, a, as an official state um, there, which a lot of those Middle Eastern countries do not recognize it as one. Um, what was to bring them together, and because the power between those would be so great, that that would kind of, in a sense, force the other wants to come along and if a group like the most likely to kind of try to avoid that would be the Shia Persian which would be Iran 
um, they would become the minority there in that. And so um, understanding that there's a lot going on <laughs> there, just even in our modern context that goes to that. And, and so you have the Abraham Accords is what this all kind of boils down to. And um, and and basically what you're seeing now, most would say the likely purpose of the attack from Iran um, and there's some debate about this. I'm not saying this is factual, you know, but I, I, th I think this is an undeniable part of it um, um, from Iran and Hamas and, and these and these groups would be to undermine the peace efforts between Israel and A Arab states, most especially Saudi Arabia, because that would be very bad for Iran. And um, Hamas has very close ties with Iran. And so therefore you kind of see what's going on here. There's always something more below the surface. You know, we see a war pop off and we're like, holy cow, you know, but, the, but this is something that's been brewing and there's more to it than that. And so I think that's a helpful um, perspective to have on what's happening in the region right now. Yeah. So I think it's really important to understand even diving a little bit deeper into the local context because you have people there that have been dwelling there for hundreds of years and the modern city of Israel is started in 1948 and even on the Palestinian side you have Christians there you also have Hamas which is a terrorist organization uh, governing Gaza and you know you and I have listened to several podcasts uh, whether I think I listened to Jocko and uh, and kind of you his would. crew and I think you listened to some so Jack Carr <laughs> right did you listen yeah. to Jack Carr yeah uh, um and so the Gaza Strip is not a wonderful place to live. Um, and so yeah. you have to kind of understand it contextually. I think for a lot of us Americans, we've been so steeped in certain theological traditions that our immediate reaction is like, Israel's God's people. And so what I want to um, what I want to do now is kind of go into like modern Judaism and how it's really disconnected from a historic Judaism we see in the Bible. Um, and this is just a quote I was reading about kind of prepping for today. And I think Doug Wilson puts it well here. He says, Modern rabb rabbinic Judaism is not the religion of the Old Testament. They are not actually following Moses. Jesus taught all Christians that the traditions of the elders had caused the Jewish leaders to set aside the requirements of Moses, observing their own ideas instead, Matthew 5, 3. And that was when they still had more than they have now, the temple and sacrifices as required by Moses. But then with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, all they had left were their erroneous traditions. This is why modern Judaism is best considered a heresy of Old Testament faith and not a representation of it. To be a Christian is to maintain that the fulfillment of the Old Testament is in the Christ of the New Testament and not in rabbinic Judaism. So he mentioned something in there, 70 AD, that's when the sacrifices stopped and that's when the temple was destroyed. Um, you know, ancient Near East uh, kind of Jewish culture it's really interesting to get into. Both you and I in seminary heard a lot about that. Uh, just just trying to give contextual understanding to how the New Testament was written, when it was written, the time it was written in. Uh, but in 70 AD, so that's around uh, 40 years after Christ rises from the dead and ascends into heaven, what we have now is Talmudic Ju Judaism, and it's very different than historic Judaism. So this gets us into some weeds that I'd love mm -hmm. to, for you to kind of get into. And it's how we understand what happened at 70 AD, because for a lot of Christians, maybe they haven't been educated, they just don't know these concepts, they didn't know there were other options, they've just been taught Israel's is God's people, Jewish people are God's people, and therefore, you know, we should defend God's people. And, and that makes sense in that framework. But help me understand, we've got some concepts here, uh, preterism, P-R-E-T-E-R-I-S-M. You've got preterism, partial preterism, those kind of things. So, so unpack that a little bit for for our church. Yeah, and and some might be glazing over as they hear this, but I think it's important to understand because as a Christian, I don't actually know if you can have a full understanding of what we're trying to deal with here without understanding these. And so, um, partial preterism. So preterism means like it's it's Latin, um, like and so it, it's. It, and, and so you're getting into things that have happened or last, you know, that, that kind of idea. And the term indicates um, partial preterism as the term um, understands most biblical prophecy or a lot of it as already fulfilled. Um, you get that in the Olivet Discourse. 
um, Antichrist, the tribulation, millennium. You, you can kind of get some of those things in there. The big one being the destruction of the temple, Nero. Um, a lot of that stuff gets associated with that time period at 70 AD that a lot of what Jesus said was to come has actually already happened. Um, you know, personally, I, I feel confident in saying that's pretty solidly where I land as a partial preterist. Um, there's things I agree and disagree with it, but. Um, but th that's where it is. Now you get into trouble when you go into full preterism and, uh, and basically uh, it contends that all biblical pro prophecy has been fulfilled. Um, that includes um, the return of Christ. Um, and um, pretty much nobody agrees with that. So, I mean, there are people out there, but, uh, but, but that's not really where you want to go. And, and, and so there's a lot of verses. I don't know if you want to go over those, Chase, that touch into those as well. Yeah, just when you read the, the the Gospels themselves, there's a lot of examples of this, and Christians have a hard time discerning, what do I do with this information with what Jesus is saying? So in Matthew 10, 23, uh, Jesus is talking, and he's talking about persecution. And he says, When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, this is where we get into the topic, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Uh, Matthew, turning over a little bit, just have to find it. I should have these all written down or memorized if I was a good pastor. Yeah. Uh, Matthew sixteen twenty eight. 28. Um, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And then Matthew 24, 34. Jesus says, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. We also have some Luke passages on there. Yeah, I got that if you want so to read it. Pull it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Luke 21, 22, right? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it says, For these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. And then Luke nine twenty seven says, wrong page. Luke nine twenty seven. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. And so the question is, what do you do with those passages? You know, for mm -hmm. a lot of people, like my background, and we'll get into my background in a little bit, but like my background would, would lead me to believe those are merely allegorical or metaphorical. They're not talking about a literal, you know, thing. They're talking about something else to come. Um, but a, a partial preterist position uh, lends itself to, I believe, a more faithful understanding of how we hold those passages to be accomplished in 70 AD. Now, the warning is, of course, you never want to go full preterist. You never go full preterist yeah. be, because you would not believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ. You would think he has already come. In fact, in my circles and some circles I run in, uh, one guy this year, it became very uh, unclear whether he was a full preterist or not because of the way he spoke and what he had written seemed to indicate that he believed that Jesus had already returned in full and that he will not return again. This goes against all what Christians have believed for millennia. And so uh, actually some of my friends, uh, John Frame included, wrote a letter, a public letter to this man to call him to bring clarity to this matter. Um, and so we don't want to go there, but we do want to take these teachings of Jesus within their context historically and understand what the 70 AD, the destruction of the temple, uh, what it what it implicated for the history of the Jewish people and for the church today. And so then the question becomes, okay, fine. What do we do with the uh, modern state of Israel? And so, Matt, do you want to talk a little bit about kind of eschatology and maybe some biblical assumptions uh, when you talk about the modern state of Israel? Yeah, and we've already mentioned them a little bit, you know, the different kind of eschatological views. And so really when we say, what are we to do with the modern state of Israel? It depends on uh, what you believe about those, those things, those end time views kind of things. And so, uh, you know, I, maybe, Chase, you, you should talk about the dispensational background because that's a yeah. little bit more of your world that you came from. Yeah, and I'll try not to make this a episode on dispensationalism, but dispensationalism was a theological tradition within evangelical Christianity in America, in England, uh, started by a guy named Schofield. Some of you may have parents, or you may have yourself a study of Schofield study Bible, and this was in the 19th century. 
And so it sought to interpret the Bible in a series of dispensations. And those dispensations were pretty rigid. Um, this was actually, if you remember, one of the first uh, theological, uh, robust theological discussions we had at the well amongst our elders was trying to figure out are we dispensational or not? And we came down on the side of no, we're not dispensational. Uh, there's a helpful article, at least it was helpful back then, uh, to us at the time, by John Piper that laid out these views. And so we're not dispensational. But for dispensationalists, they typically believe Israel is still God's people, um, that the modern state of Israel is God's people. Notice we're not talking about the Jewish people as a whole, ethnic Jews. We're just talking about the modern state of Israel as it exists today, and there are ethnic Jews there, and they hold a privilege in that nation. Um, we don't equivocate, we don't e equate the modern state of Israel with uh, kind of the the uh, the Old Testament people of God. Others of us, maybe you don't know dispensationalism, maybe you never heard that word. Just your generic American Christian, one of the big sources of confusion was this series called Left Behind. I read this when I was like 14, 15, a uh, very fun book series, uh, uh, fiction, um, and so it shapes your imagination to understand that when uh, the events in Revelation unfold, that Israel will play a outsized role in a significant way that it must center on Israel. This is where we get this these questions about, you know, will there be kind of a an end time, and there will be in some sense, but not in the way left behind means it. Will there be some kind of end time thing revolving around the nation, modern nation state of Israel regarding that land? And so if, if you're a gener general, just American Christian, this is where a lot of the tension comes from for you, because you hear not only from the politicians, you hear things like Israel is our greatest ally, and you see politicians in our country with the American flag and the Israeli flag, you hear that, but you also hear in the church, you see a Jewish flag and an American flag up by the pulpit. And so you get a lot of confusion over what the modern state of Israel is, and a lot of that is shaped, and I wouldn't just blame left behind, but it's kind of a dispensational American culture regarding the modern state of Israel. Yeah. Um, that brings us to kind of Jewish conversion. You want to talk about that, Matt? Yeah, I mean, just real quick on the left behind, just a funny thing was after I became a Christian early um, in my life, uh, well, in high school, um, somebody gave me a left behind book, book series and I plowed through that whole entire book series and like ate it up. And so if you're like, man, I read that and loved it. I get it. I did the same thing. And then I got to college and then I started reading some other stuff and I was like, oh no, um, I may have believed some kind of goofy things, you know? And so uh, if, if you want more resources where you want to study on that, we don't have time to get into all of it here. Uh, you know, we'd be happy to, to point out some good resources there to help you out. Um, but one of the things that you can note about um, all of these areas, well, one, going all the way back to when we were talking about preterism, the one thing if you're going like, how do I not be a heretic, which is a great question to ask, is always believe in the bodily uh, return of Christ, right? Like, that, like if you believe that, okay, we can work together, we can figure stuff out. But then when it comes to the conversion of Jewish people, um, pretty much all views uh, believe that there will be a great amount of Jewish conversion um, before Christ comes back. And so that's a good thing. And we should celebrate that. I mean, when you, when you get into uh, Romans 11, well, really 9 through 11, you know, it's hard to ignore that. Right. Like there is something in there about that. And so um, but it's very different than believing that the current state of of Israel is God's chosen state. It, it, it's not that there's two separate entities that exist. There's not the church and Israel. That, that, that's not what we're getting at here. It, it's that we will be one church. We will be unified together through conversion, through trust in Christ by grace alone, through faith alone, right? Like that, that's the thing. And we should all be praying for that. that that's a good and right thing. Yeah, and then another thing just biblically, just a, a, a data point to take into the conversation is that when we see the new heavens and new earth, when we see Jesus return, Jesus himself is the temple. And so <laughs> the need for the temple to rebuild, while it lends itself to a certain disposition to want to fight evil, to want to defeat Hamas, to want Israel to thrive, 
uh, while that lends itself to those kind of things, which we already clarified at the top of the episode, that's not necessary. Uh, those those assumptions aren't necessary, mainly because they're unbiblical, that we don't need Jesus to rebuild the temple for him to come back, or we don't need to build the temple for Jesus to come back. Jesus himself is the temple. I mean, he makes this very clear, abundantly clear in his teaching in the New Testament and in Revelation, particularly 21, where we see Jesus himself is the temple. Now, one of the questions, because you mentioned it, um, dispensationalism typically lends itself to like two tracks of salvation. If you're in Israel, you have certain promises afforded to you, and if you're the church, you have two promises afforded to you. This became an issue when we were teaching through, uh, I think, First Thessalonians and then some of the Psalms about the, the promises of God. And so one of the things we that is still muddy to me, um, but I know in seminary they, they really beat into my head. Do not believe in replacement theology. This is a bad thing. And at this point, I'm kind of like, is that is that a fair caricature of what I believe? I don't I don't think I believe it because in Romans 11, Jesus talks about or not Jesus, but Paul talks about our theology, our Christian convictions, and the t- and the teaching of the Bible says that the Gentiles, those who are not ethnically Jewish. Uh, were grafted in to the branch. They were a branch grafted in. God will break off the branch that may have been ethnically Jewish, and he will graft in this Gentile branch into his plan of salvation. So the plan of salvation throughout the Bible is is cover to cover. Jesus saves, Christ is Lord, and God redeems all things to himself, and God appoints the means for salvation. And so I think we just have to be careful that we don't get scared off by some terms or labels thrown at us like replacement theology, we're just trying to do justice to the biblical text and understand the promises of God. Because what I would say to Christians, what I would say to people in our church is, you can look back in the Old Testament, those promises that were made to the people of God, if you are a Christian, those promises can apply to you. Um, that you don't need to be ashamed of that. There's no prohibition on that in the New Testament. And so I think there's mm-hmm. an important consideration there because all throughout even the Old Testament, and especially in the New, We see talk about the true Israel, the people who had faith in God for his salvation alone. And you see the people of Israel, the 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 kind of ethnic group, the people group called Israel from Abraham and Jacob and Israel. And so you you have the people as a whole, but then you have those who actually believe in God. Those people are saved. And so even in the New Testament, we see that when we talk about the church, we see kind of like in the church, we don't necessarily know who's regenerate or who's not. We as pastors are uh, authorized to help determine that, to help you know, with the keys of the kingdom, the church holds those. And so we're to help determine that so that our church is holy. But at the end of the day, it's God who is in control of salvation and regeneration. So I think those are some important considerations to take into account. Yeah. And, you know, the bottom line, what it comes down to for us as Christians is that you cannot reject Christ and be saved. <laughs> I mean, if, if you want to put it as plainly and simply as possible, like that's the ultimate argue, argument. And Jesus was very clear in this, you know, as he interacted with uh, the religious leaders of his time, right? That, that, um, that you must have faith in him to be saved. And anything apart from that, um, you, you are not saved. Now, God works things out in mysterious and miraculous ways. I can't remember the exact passage. I think it's Romans 9, 6. Well, man, I just put myself out there. Um, Somebody's going to check that. but uh, um, I'll check it. (laughs) uh, But uh, I think it's something like, for for they are not all Israel who descended from Israel, right? And it's showing a distinction there. I I might have butchered that. I hope I didn't. Uh, But... No, you got it right. It says, uh, but it is not as though the word of God has failed for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel and not all who are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But though through Isaac shall your offspring be named. So yeah, Uh, dead on. Pastor points. Got it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I read that probably today, so that's probably the only reason I got it. But uh, (laughs) but yeah, so, you you know, I, I think it's it's. It's okay to go, um, it, you know, there, there's multiple places in Scripture where um, God's will is made as a mystery to us at some level. And so um, the relationship to Israel and salvation, th- there is mysterious things about that. I think we can we can give some grace there and go, man, this is complex. And also one of the reasons why what we're dealing with right now in Israel is so complex, right? Because we, we, we want... We, I, 
just to be a really humane perspective on it is I think people want to know who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. And I don't think this broken world necessarily affords us that comfort. Um, one might be more right and so on and so forth. And so I don't know if we have time, but we could talk about just war and all that kind of stuff in there as well. But, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a very complex issue. Yeah, and I think, uh, if anything, if you're a listener and you're hearing us talk about all these different theological traditions, I think at the end of the day, we're willing to play with other people. If you're at a church who are from a, you're from a more dispensational perspective, you believe, um, you know, Israel is God's chosen people still today. You know, we're you're welcome at our church. We're not going to teach that way, but uh, <laughs> we would both agree that the attack on Israel was bad and morally wrong. There's no question mm. in my mind about that, and that Israel has a right and duty to defend itself. Now that that starts to get us into areas that I don't particularly want to go into but we do have some areas on just war theory and proportionality but we do want to just say that out loud uh, so that people can take heart and know like no like we we have uh, uh they have a moral obligation before god and nature to defend themselves uh, as a people group as a nation and that the way this attack was conducted was uh ethically morally wrong uh, regardless of your theological priors. Um, you just have to understand the modern state of Israel is different. And so when you get wrapped up in a lot of these narratives about the Israelites, the modern state of Israel, the Jewish people, all this kind of stuff, you have to understand, like, Israel is a liberal democracy, which is very much an ethno state. It is like, it is Jewish nationalism. That's what it is. Um, and so we won't chase that rabbit on this episode, no. but it, it's just a very interesting topic to get into, especially with all the heat surrounding Christian nationalism. Jewish nationalism seems to be uh, perfectly acceptable, and I'm not even opposed to it. So, uh, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Don't yeah that's it. I know. You, you set me up, and I'm not going to do it. I, I have matured in, over these years, Chase. Um, so many thoughts there. T talk to us offline. Hit us up on the, the uh, Well app chat, and we'll, we can talk there um, more about yeah, exactly. it. Actually, nowhere where text is printed. We'll do it face-to-face -face only. Um, but uh, <laughs> I learned that from this organization we used to be part of. Um, so, yeah, uh, Acts, it's called the Acts 29 way. <laughs> oh, yeah. I forgot. That's who it is. The, the ethno-national state of Acts. 29. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, anyways, we're getting off topic. Let me get us back. Uh, so, you know, I mean, we, we can talk about pro proportionality of attack and just theory. Um, you know, I, I'll provide a little bit of opinion um, here, and, and that's what this is. So let me just be very clear in that. Um, just war theory is uh, an interesting concept because I, I think it derives out of something very good, a desire that understands that People need to defend and protect themselves. And how are we to go about this the right way? And, and, and many people, I won't get too d deep in the weeds in this. Where does that kind of stuff come from? Well, it comes from, um, you know, when Constantine, um, basically, all of a sudden, Christians had power. They had never had power. They were always the persecuted ones. They never had to learn how to, to necessarily fight and defend their land because they were always on the run. And now they're the people. And then you go to Augustine and, and so on and so forth. And so they, it, it, um, I, I listened to somebody. I can't remember who it was, but they said something. It was like, well, what do we do now that the sword's in our hand? You know, we have to develop a way to think about um, th these sorts of things like proportionality of attack and how we treat people in war, what we attack, what we don't attack. What, what are the rules here? The complex thing here, again, to add another layer that makes it so complex, is that um, just war theory, I, I think, works when everybody agrees that we're gonna play by the same rules. When you're dealing with a terrorist group, such as Hamas, and their singular goal is to wipe people off the face of the earth, that they don't care about rules. And, and, and so, you know, you highly limit yourself. That's actually been a critique of people at the United States, whether you agree or not. I'm not making a statement of whether I do or not, but it's kind of our uh, attitude towards the last several wars that we've been involved in, whether or not we should have been there is a whole other thing. Um, but it's kind of like you're trying to fight the Taliban in a humane way while they're not going to respond that way. So therefore, it doesn't work, you know, and, and you just kind of get bled out over time. And so... 
you know, people can go like, hey, Israel should operate this way. And what Israel, what I'm perceiving them saying right now is that's not going to work for us. Um, we'll, we'll see right. what time shows there, but I think it's an important thing to think about. Um, but what I can say, and as Christians, I think this is an extremely important part, is that we should always be people that mourn the taking of innocent life on both sides. That we, we, we don't want that, that that's never the case. We don't want the taking of any lives as Christians. Like war is is a terrible, terrible thing. Um, and, and so um, anybody who would elevate it as a good thing, like this is great, that the just kill, kill them all kind of thing. Um, while I understand that tension and we have to wrestle with that in the Bible when God says that, um, that there, there's a difference between what's going on here with what God ordains versus what man wants to ordain. Yeah, absolutely. And I think with, you know, the, the reality is that there are Christians in Gaza, there are Christians in Israel. And, mm. um, and so we, we really have to uh, think concretely and biblically about matters rather than get sucked into kind of this hyper, uh, not just partisan, but like uh, aggressive, you know, because, you know, I think if I were to just be honest, and like you just said, this is opinion, this is just my thoughts. When I first hit, heard about the Isra uh, attack on Israel, just my gut reaction, whether it was my background or whatever, it was like, they should just get rid of the Gaza Strip. They should not necessarily wipe all those people off the map, but like they should just, but the, the complex situation is you've got families there and Hamas is embedding uh, their rockets and uh, other military equipment in uh, civilian populations. And so any attack on a Hamas kind of uh, compound or site in the Gaza Strip will have civilian casualties. It's just part of the the nature of war. Just real quick, just a side on this is like I think a lot of times as as people in the 21st century, we look at this and we expect war to be clean, like a surgery. And so you see, Navy SEALs are able to go into a country, extract, be very precise. But man, you look back a generation, my grandfather's generation, World War II. You know, we were carpet bombing Germany. Um, yeah. Now, whether you want to say good or bad, and the same thing they were doing to other countries too, this was just common understanding that in a state of war, there is there is death that follows. And that's why we should want to avoid war, not at necessarily all costs, but we should try to do a lot to avoid war. And so when you see, see you, Boulder, talking about proportionality, I think that that's a nice idea that somehow you could put on a spreadsheet like what would be the appropriate amount of death they could inflict in Gaza on Hamas that would be proportional to the thing of Israel but like you have to understand with Israel specifically as a nation state the nations surrounding them want them to be wiped off the map they want them yeah. all to be murdered and so Israel exists in a permanent state of not just anxiety um, but of perpetual like uh, death, like these people want death. And so that's just an important consideration, but you also have to understand it's, it's extremely complex in the propaganda coming at you, whether you're on Twitter or watching the news, it's unending because it's a propaganda war. We live in a new age where, you know, this was happening with America, with Russia, with Germany, with all these countries back in the day, they would show propaganda films to their troops to try to, you know, impart to them a certain narrative. But especially today, we're getting cell phone clips, we're getting all these things and we don't get real data, we don't understand what's going on. And so you just have to really settle yourself before the Lord, talk with some people that you know you can trust theologically and not get uh, so taken off guard by a certain narrative that the world wants to feed you. Um, Cause that's a really important thing. And then the last thing I'll say on this matter is that Hamas is a wicked Islamic death cult. Islam is not, uh, does not have the same relationship to Christianity that Judaism is. Judaism is like the older brother in the story of the prodigal son it is like a, a an older brother um who is now not part of the family uh whereas uh islam is a total aberration uh from what we believe and not only that but like part of their tenets are jihad um this idea that islam is a religion of peace that's a nice secular idea but that's not in the quran and so you have to understand hamas specifically is a wicked Islamic death cult that's intent on wiping Jewish people off the face of the earth, um, which is why it's so disturbing when we see people today rallying in England and France and Germany and America for, and in Canada too, for Hamas. It's like, holy crap, like this, this anti-Semitism that you hear all about, that's alive and well. 
and it, it's yeah. all rooted around Palestine, um, and that's really disturbing. Yeah, and and we should reject that fully, just to be clear, you know, like because we could play a lot of what aboutism with all of these topics, you know, but we need to come back rooted to the Word of God and what does it say and. You know, I mean, it, it's a it's a very hard thing, but I, you know, I just as an, I just thought of it. We didn't have it planned or anything, but I, I thought of um, Psalm two, which is always an uplifting psalm. Um, you know, but uh, I think it is. Many don't, but you know, when it says, um, in, starting in verse one, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, "Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us." He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, Ask for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. And so I think it's an important thing for us to remember that that's not God being insensitive to death. We know that our Lord is one that hates death, um, so much so that he was willing to die for it himself. Um, and, but he, when we go like, what is it happening and what are all these people doing? Um, I find comfort that when I see evil plotting, um, globally, that we have a God who kind of laughs at them and says, that's silly. You know, you you don't do anything apart from what I uh, allow or am in ultimate control of. And so I I would encourage Christians to to keep that perspective in in difficult and trying times and in states of confusion that we have a sovereign Lord who is overall and that these rulers and kings and presidents, nobody's tricking God. Nobody's like sneaking one past him here. And so he's still sovereign in control of all of this. Yeah. And so we should be sober minded about this. Um, I think, you know, the, the, like I mentioned at the top of the episode, it reminds me a lot of, you know, the kind of these crisis events, uh, whether it's Black Lives Matter or January 6th or Afghanistan or whatever, uh, the election, whatever it is, uh, which we've got another one coming up next year. So I'm sure we'll do an episode on that. <laughs> yeah, can't uh, wait. But the, the the particular irony for me is, you know, we were always a little suspicious of, of Black Lives Matter uh, from the beginning. And that's why we never like as a church released any kind of statement or anything like that. But it, it's highly uh indicative and ironic that BLM, the organization, would put out, you know, propaganda saying they stand with the Palestinians. And so a lot of the narratives were being fed by certain media outlets are very like they're very curated that Palestine, Palestinians in the Gaza Strip are oppressed. Now as Christians, the hard thing is they kinda are oppressed. It's like an open like what what did you call it earlier, Matt? Like a, a jail? Is that what it is? Yeah, like, I mean, Gaza is, I've listened to, I've tried to listen widely, you know, so people who are like, Matt just listens to whatever, that's not necessarily true. But I mean, you know, the, you're in a state that is essentially um, a, a territory that is um, all its power and water is controlled by outside sources. There's no um, way of really growth in there. You're kind of stuck. And so they refer to it as an open air prison is what people refer to it as. Um, I have not been there. I don't know. I'm regurgitating what I have heard. And so, but sure. we can admit that that's a very difficult position to be in. Yeah. And so my, I guess my point in bringing it up is like, if you believe that, you know, kind of liberal theology teaches Jesus stands on the side, side of the oppressed then your natural disposition is going to want to be to side with a certain group. And in our, our world, particularly with neo-Marxism in the, in the water, in the academy, in politics, you're going to naturally hear these people are oppressed. You're going to think, why does a Christian have to stand with the oppressed? And what we're trying to discourage you from is believing that and following that, because this is what is, you end up supporting terrorists who do bad sure. things to people who murder babies. And so you do not want to do this. Um, so it's just really, 
ironic to me in that sense. But but like like you said, Matt, we want to be sober minded. We want to think biblically and theologically about these matters. And ultimately, what we want to do as Christians is proclaim the good news of Jesus to Jewish people and to Muslims. We want all people to become Christians. We want to share the good news of the gospel. Our God is a God of peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And so it is Jesus who brings peace. And so that is our ultimate hope. It's not uh, an ultimate hope in some kind of temple rebuilding project. The temple is already being built. It's the church. We are the temple of, of the living God, and Jesus Christ. We are his body. And so our hope is in that and in his return, which he says will be soon. And so we pray Maranatha, uh, as the Bible says, and we hope he will return soon. But we don't need to be uh, so anxious about, you know, World War III. Um, just, just before we got on air, uh, Mark Driscoll you know, is going off about how World War Three is coming. And you're kind of like, man, like this guy is, he is just taking whatever pills you can find at the gas station, get him, you know, get his gas going. And it's like crazy. You know, it feels it feels so intense. And I'm not saying there's not intense things. There's not danger in the world. And I'm not trying to cry peace, peace where there is no peace. That's not what I'm doing. It could be World War Three, but we shouldn't be so caught up in theological tra traditions that mislead us and propaganda hmm. that's trying to agitate us to certain actions. So that would be my final part. Anything else you want to add, Matt? Yeah, I would just add this as just an exhortation to our people is that we are to be a joyful bunch in the midst of trials and persecution, right? We are, um, as much as that is, and, and one of the things we always, you know, we quote Lewis, and I'm butchering it a little bit, but he refers to it as a, uh, like, it, it's not an emotion that comes and goes. It's something that Christ has done in us because of a future hope that we have um, in the return of Christ and our eternality with him. And so we can look at things and, um, my encouragement is joy gets you out of being myopic and short-sighted. And um, it, it helps you uh, recenter yourself and go, whatever may come, I know that Christ is with me. He promised me that um, in the Great Commission, that he'll be with us till the end of the age. And so we have that promise. And so no matter what may or may not come, we have that. And so we can rest in that. Yeah. All right. Well, this was a great uh, conversation. I'm sure there's tons more. We could go on for hours talking about this. Uh, we'd probably have a lot of fun. But I just want to encourage you, if you're a member at the well, if you attend the well, even if you're listening from the outside, um, these kind of things aren't in our statement of faith for a reason. Uh, because we're trying not to draw hard lines on, well, if you believe Israel's people of God, you're not welcome at our church. That's not what we're saying. Now, if you're a preterist, you know, we need to call you to repentance of that heresy. But, <laughs> you know, we, we really, we, the reason we put it on just say it and not from the pulpit is because we have a duty to equip the church uh, for the work of ministry. And so we just want to provide this episode to be informative, to be helpful. You may disagree with what we said. Totally fine. Uh, happy to get a conversation offline with you. Always welcome to do that. So I really do hope this equipped you. Maybe it gave you a little bit of a uh, teaser to go explore some other theological stuff, whether it's partial preterism, your eschatological views, uh, some Bible texts that we mentioned. So I would encourage you to study the word, be, be a diligent student of it. Um, and so I hope this episode blessed you, and we'll see you next time.